My name's Nate Fick. I'm the CEO of the Center for a New American Security, and it's a real honor to welcome you to our fifth annual conference. Hard to believe it's been five already. I am currently, at my wife's request, reading David Brooks' new book, The Social Animal, and she inscribed it to me, to my anti-social animal. <laughs> and there's a scene in the book where he describes an intersection in Washington that has a think tank on each corner. And this intersection is described as the boringest place on the face of the earth. <laughs> and so our pledge today to you is that this room will not be the boringest place in Washington, and hopefully we'll be a far, uh, long way from it. We've tried to make this our most interactive conference ever. In addition to the thousand attendees we'll have in person, we have a live web page at cnas.org slash live, and we're going to webcast the whole thing. Almost 4,000 people around the world watched the last one, and we're hoping to increase the viewership this time. We're also going to tweet it. Someone's going to tweet it. I don't, <laughs> despite my relative youth, don't actually know how to do that. Um, under the hashtag pound CNAS 2011. One of the founding principles of CNAS was that all of our products would be free to all readers and that all of our events would be free to all attendees. And even in Washington, that's a crummy business model. So we thank our sponsors for making today possible. They're on the screen behind me. They're also listed in your programs. And I'd like to single out for special thanks Mission Essential Personnel and their CEO, Chris Taylor. Uh, Chris, like me, thank you. Absolutely, I won't cut that off. <laughs> Chris, like me, is a former recon Marine, and we were graduate school classmates. He somehow overcame these handicaps to run a successful uh, high-growth company, and uh, it's an honor to have him here, and we thank MEP for their support. I have a 15-month-old daughter, and she often does literally what I'm going to try to avoid metaphorically here, uh, namely navel-gazing and drinking her own bathwater. But uh, I am going to spend just a few minutes, I hope you'll indulge me, given that this is our fifth conference, with a, just a minute on the history of CNAS, um, a little bit on the role of think tanks, and then a bit of a preview of the day. So CNAS was started uh, nearly five years ago by Michelle Flournoy and Kirk Campbell, uh, John Noggle and I at that point were sharing an office in the back of our space. Uh, and about two years ago, the inmates took over the prison uh, when Kurt and Michelle left for government. And so in the last couple of years, along with our VP and Director of Studies, Kristen Lord, and our Chairman, Richard Danzig, we've published more than 60 reports on national security topics ranging from the current wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to the intersection of energy and national security, a field that we call, uh, dub natural security, to regional issues in the Asia-Pacific, to the topic of national security in the information age. And through it all, we've learned a few things. It's not false modesty to say if we tried to lead this place and run this place the way Kurt and Michelle did, we would have failed. And we had to adopt a different model. And the model is really has three parts. Our job is to recruit and retain the best talent to foster a healthy organizational culture of innovation and collaboration, and then to resource it well. And the thinking is, if you've got great people in a great environment with the right resources, then the products are going to be good. But one of the questions that's always paramount in our mind isn't really about policy. It's more about organizational design. The, the how is as important as the what. And so the fundamental question is, where do good ideas come from? And I can offer a stab at an answer. They come from groups, but not from committees. There has to be some structure, but not too much. They come from unexpected sources. Organizations have to be intellectually egalitarian, even if we recognize they need hierarchy in order to function. And they come from the cross-pollination of different interests and expertise. And that really leads to a few comments on the role of think tanks. Nothing focuses the mind quite so quickly as having to make payroll, and so you very quickly have to answer the question, so what is this good for? And especially in the national security field, where you have $700 billion in annual spending in this space, uh, and that leaves quite reasonable people scratching their heads 
and asking, well, why do we need to pay more people to do this? And I'd argue that the answer is around us today, and you're going to see some of it on display. Think tanks and organizations like them optimally, in my mind, do three things. They do work that has policy impact. They exist in the space somewhere between the tyranny of the inbox in government and the deeply theoretical work of academia. Second, they, as nonprofits, have power to convene, to get people in one room. Uh, they cut across boundaries from government to business, across political boundaries, across national boundaries. And third, they can help train the next generation of leaders in their field. We take seriously our collateral mission of training the next generation of national security leaders. And later this afternoon, you'll see an example of that on display as we announce our next Basevich Fellow. And that really leads to the substance of today's conference. The title is Risk and Reward, American Security in an Age of Uncertainty. And I freely admit that at CNAS, I'm the spreadsheet junkie, not the originator of most of our substantive work. But I'm going to posit a hypothesis here that there are at least a few global trends that are informing all of the work that we'll discuss here today. One is that there are more and more actors on the world stage. The unipolar moment has passed, if it ever existed. Not only rising state actors, but the proliferation of non-state actors. And non-state actor isn't a pejorative term. Big foundations are non-state actors, just as Al-Qaeda is a non-state actor. And the ability of super-empowered individuals, a person with a billion dollars and a broadband connection, to influence global events. So more actors. The barriers to entry to high-end capability are falling. So it's easier and easier to have global impact. Not only the proliferation of nuclear know-how, think about advances in biotechnology, think about cyber capability. And third, access to information is increasing. And with increased democratization of access to information, it's harder and harder to maintain double standards and the gaps between rhetoric and reality become harder to maintain. So all of these trends, more actors, an easier ability to have global impact, and the difficulty of maintaining the illusion of consistency mean that prediction is going to get harder and harder. Uh, we're doing a project right now on the nature of prediction, led by our chairman. And the fundamental thesis is that our innate human desire to predict is outweighed only by our inability to do it well. And as prediction gets harder, uh, what does it mean for risk and reward? We, we know only really that risk and reward are correlated. Arbitrage opportunities in national security are pretty rare, just as they are in the market. And how can we cope with a world that is increasingly complex where prediction is harder and, and harder? I was just having a conversation before we started uh, with Mike Harwood, and we share an enthusiasm for a slide that Marty Dempsey likes to use. And it's a picture, an aerial photo of a bridge, a very graceful concrete span that was built by the Japanese in Honduras in the 80s to span a river and link some villages on one side to some markets on the other. And then a hurricane blew through and the river moved out from under the bridge. And so the, the central challenge in a complex world where prediction is harder and harder is to build organizations and train leaders and devise doctrine and buy systems that minimize our risk that the river will move out from under the bridge. We need to learn and we need to adapt. And so as we look at the work today through this lens of risk and reward, uh, I, I just want to run through a little bit of what you'll see. A project that we did on cybersecurity. And cyber exists in that strange nebulous space where the, the challenge is to do something useful that is both unclassified and accessible to non-technologists. And there are plenty of folks in the cyber community who would say that that space doesn't exist, that you can't do anything useful that is both unclassified and accessible to non-technologists. I'm interested to hear your views afterward uh, on whether we, we may have actually contributed something useful in that narrow slice. I think we have. And, and I think that it's hard to make enduring national policy that is entirely classified and basically unaccessible to non-technologists. Internet freedom, it's the other side of the cyber coin. 
any full discussion of authentication and identification has to also include some discussion about anonymizers and proxy servers. These, uh, these two sides of the same issue uh, are essential to advancing the national security interests of the United States. Critical minerals. We're not doing a panel on critical minerals, but we've released a paper today. CNAS pioneered this field of natural security at the intersection of natural resources and national security. And this paper examines the importance of defense supply chains to not only our national security, but also to our economic health. Beyond Afghanistan, who better than General Dave Barno, who commanded there from 2003 to 2005, to lead our work looking at enduring U.S. interests in South and Central Asia after the large American footprint there comes to its inevitable end? Iran, one of the surest examples of the simple reality that the enemy gets a vote, that context matters, the changing landscape in the Middle East has changed U.S. options with Iran. And Mark Lynch not only analyzes the problem, but also, and this is rare, offers a concrete proposal for a way forward. We're also going to hear today from General Rodriguez via VTC and from the new Director of Policy Planning at State, Jake Sullivan. And it's worth recounting to this group a conversation I had with my predecessor, Kirk Campbell. I asked him, he's now the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, and I asked Kurt, who was the most impressive up-and-comer at state? Who can we get to the annual conference who's, who's really going to knock people's socks off and say something interesting? And he sort of swallowed hard and choked back his own name, I could tell. <laughs> and, and finally he said, Jake. So we look forward to hearing from Jake. We're going to close the day uh, with a panel looking at China and the Asia Pacific. In a way, it's a capstone because of the central role that China and the broader Asia-Pacific play and all the other topics that we're going to cover today. And I should note, finally, that today's proceedings will be published by the Marine Corps University Press, uh, a first for us and something we're excited about. Just a couple of teasers on upcoming events before I invite our first panel to the stage. We have a Writers in Residence program at CNAS where we bring top-flight national security journalists in to do long-form work away from their editors for a little while. And our current writers uh, are Tom Shanker and Eric Schmidt from the New York Times. They've written a history of American counterterrorism policies since 9-11 called Counter-Strike. And they were scheduled to turn their manuscript in during the first week of May. Uh, and sometimes better lucky than good, right? Uh, Bin Laden's death provided the, the perfect endpoint to a narrative arc for them. Uh, they went back to, the, back to the drawing board to rewrite a few things and, and gin up a new last chapter. Um, but we'll be holding a launch event for their book this fall and uh, hope that all of you can attend. And also our fifth anniversary gala, uh, which we'll hold on January 31st of 2012 and uh, at the W Hotel just a block away with a dinner and then afterward a dance party. Am I allowed to say this, Colin? I think I can. Uh, a dance party led by DJ Colin Call, whom you're about to see up here on the, uh, on the stage. But we've... Uh, I saw Colin get General Petraeus and his wife out on the dance floor, so we have high hopes. And so with a, with a final thanks to all of you for being here and a final pledge from all of us to keep this far from the boringest place in Washington today, I'd like to inv invite to the stage our Internet Freedom and Middle East panel. Thanks. Enjoy. Happy to see all of you. Uh, I'm Karen Elliott House. Uh, I'm on the board here and uh, spent many years in Washington as a diplomatic correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and then became a bureaucrat for the Wall Street Journal in charge of, like Nate, with some uh, business bottom line responsibilities uh, and retired as publisher of the journal in 2006 and am now writing a book about Saudi Arabia. So I'm uh, looking forward to hearing the panel. I'm going to make some brief introductions of the speakers and of the topic, and then lay the foundation by moderating uh, some discussion, and then go to you, because I know from sitting in audiences that you come to events like this to have the opportunity to ask questions of people like these, uh, and there's nothing worse than a moderator who doesn't know when to share and shut up. Um, I'm going to start by just mentioning the Internet Freedom Study that uh, uh, Nate mentioned because 
it does give a really good discussion of the issue of technology and the double-edged sword that it is. Um, and hopefully, we'll hear some more about that because one of the authors is, uh, is on our panel. We have four truly, I think, genuine experts here this morning in, in different areas. Uh, on my immediate right, uh, Colin Call, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East and prior to that was a fellow here at the uh, uh, center and a teacher at Georgetown, although he tells me now he has only one job at the Pentagon. He can't have a side job the way he uh, did here. Uh, he is an expert on uh, counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, the causes and consequences of violent civil and ethnic conflict. So well positioned to talk about the topic here of the Middle East. Um, on my left is Dr. Shadi Hamid, who is just flew in last night from Doha. He uh, works uh, for Brookings there. He is an expert on Islamist political parties and uh, democratic reform in the Middle East, which he was studying long before the Arab Spring. Uh, on my far right is uh, Richard Fontaine, who, as I mentioned, is an author of the Internet Freedom Study and has experience on the Hill, uh, five years w as the foreign policy uh, advisor for Senator McCain, um, experience at the NSC, where he was the associate director for Near Eastern uh, Affairs, and at State, where he worked on South Asia. On my far left, I don't know about politically, but situationally, Andrew Exum. <laughs> uh, Presbyterian. Who is, uh, uh, has served in the US Army in both Afghanistan uh, and Iraq, uh, was an advisor to General Stanley uh, McChrystal, and is the author of this Man's Army, A Soldier's Story from the Front Lines of the War on Terror, uh, and has a degree in Middle Eastern Studies from the American University in Beirut, and has been all over the region, um, and, and specifically in Egypt after the uh, revolution. I think uh, all of us have watched the administration be somewhat conflicted about how to respond to events in the Middle East this spring, um, where to support stability of autocratic regimes and where to support democracy uh, for which uh, America stands. I suspect some of us have also been conflicted precisely because not all Middle Eastern regimes, while authoritarian, are the same. There are gradations of authoritarianism, and there are clearly gradations of strategic importance of these countries to the US. So where do we draw which lines is one of the things I hope we can draw people out on. Libya is obviously a terribly repressive regime, and I would argue is not strategically very important to the US. Syria is, in my view, an equally a uh, nasty regime, but is far more inimical to US interests, if only because it serves as an Iranian proxy in the region. So why do we fight Libya and largely ignore Syria? Uh, Egypt had a relatively repressive ruler and was relatively important to us, but after some hesitation, we helped the Egyptians Ho Mubarak, and Saudi Arabia, which uh, has an authoritarian, but I would say paternalistically smothering uh, regime, uh, is by far the most important country in the region to the US. And our president couldn't even bring himself to utter its name in his latest Middle East speech, which I found quite interesting. Um, 
The Wall Street Journal, for which I no longer have any responsibility, has laid out or advocated that the strategy in the Middle East ought to be protect, support our friends, and be for regime change with our enemies. So I'm also interested if we can even agree on who our friends and enemies are. And I won't go on about Iran and Pakistan, which are probably in many ways more important to us than anybody in the Middle East except uh, Saudi Arabia. So with that backdrop, I'm going to start with you, Colin, to get you to lay out what are the principles that the administration uses. Uh, we once uh, had Ariel Sharon visit us at the Journal, and he said that you ought to have your, your your principles and policies ought to be so clear that in essence you like a woman with a recipe box, you Iran, you just go in there and take out the card and it tells you what to do. <laughs> uh, I'd like to know what the principles are on the recipe cards in the Pentagon box. Well, it sounds like the Joint Staff wanting to have that plan on the shelf when the uh, President asks uh, for it. Um, I should say, after Nate Fick destroyed my credibility by saying I was going to play music at the uh, CNAS event on, in January, that in my, my day job, I, I run the Middle East office at the Pentagon, and the Middle East is defined a little bit differently across the government. In, in, in the Pentagon, my office covers the region from Egypt up through Israel and the Levant to Iraq, Iran, down the Gulf and Arabian Peninsula to Yemen. So I don't deal with Libya, so I'm not going to talk about that. I don't deal with Afghanistan and Pakistan. I just have those easy countries uh, in between. Uh, so I'll, I'll focus uh, on that. Um, you know, it's been said about revolution that uh, prospectively they look impossible and retrospectively they look inevitable. And I think that that's never been truer uh, than in the Middle East. I think, uh, I know this panel is very much about the internet. I'm not going to talk uh, uh, about the internet, but one thing I will uh, say is that I don't think the internet caused any of this. I think what the internet did was facilitate collective action in response to a set of underlying structural tensions in this part of the world, political, economic, in terms of legit legitimacy deficits, the relationship between this part of the world and, and, and other parts of the world that have been around for decades uh, and have now been unleashed. You know, Secretary Gates, who's still my boss for another, another 30 days or so, uh, has, has likened what we're seeing to the shifting of tectonic plates that have been frozen in place for six decades and unleashing a political earthquake and a tsunami of change uh, across the region. I think we don't know where it's going to, going to go, and I think we all need to be humble uh, about that. So let me just say a couple words about the fact that as we go into this, we, we don't go into it as dyed-in-the-wool realists nor pie-in-the-sky idealists, that we see a set of, of challenges uh, in the region and a set of opportunities in the region that emerge from the Arab Awakening or the Arab Spring, whatever you want to call it. And I would say that we tend to think of these in terms of four bins or baskets of challenges and opportunities. Okay? One uh, relates to uh, how, the, how all of this will affect our relationship and cooperation with so many countries in this part of the world to include our partners. I think that if you look at countries that are democratizing and, ha and, and governments that are going to be more responsive to political will, and that's true of new democracies in places like Egypt and Tunisia, but it's also true of governments that survive this democratic uh, unrest, they'll also have to be more responsive to, to the street. I think there are some possibilities that this will complicate our cooperation with some of these countries. We very much have, have had cooperations with specific governments and sometimes specific leaders, and new actors uh, will bring new uncertainties uh, in, our, in our relationship. At the same time, I think that one of the opportunities that this, uh, that this chain of events represents is the ability to deepen and build a more lasting and enduring relationship with countries that more closely align with our values, where our relationships are not, are not determined simply by a set of key ties with a handful of leaders, but are deeper and, uh, across, uh, across the region. So in the near term, it's going to create uh, some tension, frankly, in some places. But in the long term, I think it's ultimately in the US uh, interest. A second basket is kind of the Al-Qaeda basket, or the violent extremism basket. On the one hand, unrest in some countries, like we're seeing today uh, in Yemen, will provide opportunities for violent extremists uh, to potentially expand uh, their area of operation in ungoverned spaces. We're seeing Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula uh, hold more terrain uh, in Yemen today than they did six months ago, largely as a consequence of the unrest. But I think the more fundamental opportunity that the Arab Spring poses, at least the way that we see it, is to fundamentally destroy Al-Qaeda's narrative. About, what's, about the pathway for change in this part of the world. That, 
I like that uh, Thomas Friedman pointed to the delicious irony of the fact that Osama bin Laden spent his last days watching the Egyptian people do what he and Ayman al-Zawahiri, who of course is, was Egyptian, could never accomplish, and that was topple the Mubarak uh, government. A pathway of peaceful unrest and peaceful political change in advance of universal values as opposed to uh, values that are a thousand years old and aren't widely uh, 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 subscribed to by most people on earth is a huge rebuke uh, to al-Qaeda. And I think in combination with bin Laden's death uh, is, a, is a sign that they are very much on the decline. The third basket is Iran. Uh, you know, we've been very clear from the outset that Iran didn't cause any of this. Uh, Secretary Gates has, has said, uh, no country in the history of the world uh, not us, not the Iranians, nobody has had the ability to create this much change in such a short period of time. All right? We didn't start this, the Iranians didn't start this. But it's also clear that the Iranians are hoping to capitalize on this unrest. Now, the Supreme Leader, shortly after the unrest started in Egypt, tried to say that this was all inspired by Iran's Islamic Revolution. Well, the revolutions are a, are a repudiation of that notion as well. This, these weren't inspired by Iran's uh, ideology. These folks aren't, aren't on the streets pushing for uh, an, an Iranian-style theocracy. Uh, so I think ultimately, uh, while there may be some avenues for Iran to exploit in the short term, and we have to, be, we have to recognize that, in the long term, this is not going to work to Iran's uh, advantage. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, these countries in this, part of the, in this part of the world, if you allow people to get dignity in Arab countries through Arab governments that are seen as legitimate, Iran's ability to exploit grievances, anxieties, and the aspirations for greater dignity on the Arab street will be marginalized over time. You're also going to see the stand-up, I think, of rival democratic states like Egypt and perhaps the new Iraq, which will ultimately, I think, be counterweights of, of some sort against Iranian influence. And then lastly, there's just the fundamental hypocrisy of the fact that Iran is claiming to stand up for protest movements everywhere around the region, except, of course, inside Iran or in its ally, uh, Syria, uh, where brutal repression uh, has denied the very freedoms that we saw expressed in Tahrir Square uh, or in Tunis. And then the last basket is the Middle East peace process. I think on the one hand, uh, this has created a lot of anxiety in Israel for understandable reasons. Egypt is a pillar of, of you know, uh, to the degree that there is uh, Arab-Israeli peace, the two pillars are Egypt and Jordan. And in both places, from an Israeli perspective, those are now shakier because of the Arab unrest. On the other hand, there are opportunities for uh, that peace to deepen and, again, become a peace between people as, a pe as opposed to a peace between uh, leaders. And on the Palestinian question, President Obama has encouraged the Israelis to get out of in front of the populist wave that's sweeping the region. The Arab Spring is not about Israel, but as elections start to take place in Egypt and other places, Israel will be an issue, and it's in Israel's interest uh, to take arguments away from extremists who would seek to use Israel's uh, 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 relationship with the Palestinians against Israeli uh, interests. So it's a very complex mosaic. We've basically tackled it in two ways. One is to, folk, is to articulate a common set of principles, and we've emphasized three. One, we oppose violence in all circumstances. Governments should not repress their people, and doing so will only invite more opposition. Protests, protesters also have an obligation, by the way, to not engage in violence. So that's the first principle. Second, we support universal rights in every country without exception. As the president said in Cairo in 2009 and again 10 days ago, those rights include freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, uh, the freedom to peacefully protest, and the right to have access to information. Third, we support political and economic reform that is responsive to the people in the region. And it's our belief that the status quo, whether you liked it or didn't, is gone. The status quo ante is not, we're not going to return there. The status quo wasn't sustainable, and ultimately it wasn't stable. And that there's a real opportunity now to align our principles and our values. That's the general. That's the top line message, OK? And we have been consistent about that throughout this crisis. But we've had to adapt our policy and the specifics of that policy to the specific conditions in every country. It's not hypocrisy. It's not a tension. It's not choosing values over interests. It's navigating a pragmatic way forward in each of these places, cognizant of the fact that we do have different interests in different places. We do have different influence uh, in, in different places. So in countries like uh, you know, Egypt and Tunisia, we've been very forward-leaning in supporting democracy. We're also standing up and helping to consolidate the democracy in Iraq and look forward to a long-term partnership with them. In countries like Jordan, we're encouraging. Can I just ask you on yeah. Iraq for a second? Do you think Iraq had any impact on the, I want to ask you the causes, if, it, if what made this happen? Um, do you think Iraq did have any impact? You know, I don't know because the, the distance was so great, you know, and 
uh, you know, the, two, the toppling of Saddam Hussein in 2003, good news was it got rid of a dictator. The bad news was it unleashed a, a set of instabilities that left thousands and thousands of Iraqis displaced and dead and sent a message to the region in some respects that democratization is accompanied by sectarian and religious warfare and insurgency. So I, don't, I think historians are going to have to sort out the Iraq effect, and it's, and it's, and it's too soon to tell. But without relitigating the past, I would say moving forward, it's our administration's belief that you do need to consolidate democracy in Iraq, and you do need to consolidate the long-term strategic partnership between the United States and Iraq for all the reasons that were true six months ago, but are even more true in the context of the Arab, in the Arab Spring. Um, let me say just a, a few words, and then, then I'll, I'll shut up and let others talk about some other places. Um, in Yemen, I think we, we have vital interest in combating al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and a vital interest in that country not becoming a completely failed state or descending into civil war. At the same time, we've been very forward-leaning in uh, encouraging President Saleh to live up to his commitments to step, to step aside, and we're working with the GCC states uh, to try to uh, make that happen. Uh, throughout the Gulf, we've been reassuring to our partners in this part of the world that all the reasons why we cooperated with you before, that that's the underpinning of our strategic partnership, our interest in counterterrorism, in countering proliferation, in countering Iran's hegemonic uh, ambitions, in maritime security, in ballistic missile defense, all of these areas, all those arguments for cooperation are the same today as they were six months ago. But we have also articulated to our partners in the Gulf that we have a common interest in stability, and that stability in the new environment requires evolutionary progress towards political and economic reform. Right? And that has been our message in all the countries in the Gulf, and most particularly, uh, that's been our message uh, with Bahrain, which is now starting uh, to move back in a positive direction, I hope. Um, but it's, it's a problem we're going to have to challenge, we're going to have to continue to navigate. And then lastly, on Syria, the president, again, was very clear 10 days ago when he said that President Assad in Syria faces a fundamental choice. He can either lead or leave. Uh, if he doesn't lead a transition, which frankly doesn't look all that likely at the moment, you know, yesterday he announced amnesty and then his forces started shelling more villages. All right. uh, if he doesn't uh, stop the human rights abuses, if he doesn't stop the detentions, the arrests, if he doesn't allow investigators to come in, if he doesn't engage in general in reform, then the alternative is clear. He's going to face more pressure, more isolation, and more, and, and more demands. Uh, so. Um, you know, we have this general set of principles, and then we've tried to navigate our way through each of these specific uh, circumstances. And I've only really hit the wave tops on these, and I'd be happy to talk uh, about any of these in whatever depth you'd like. Thanks. Can I just ask you quickly, um, what do you think, as someone who's been studying this region and looking at democratic impulses, what do you think caused this tectonic shifting of the plates? What are the causes? Or do they differ? Uh, is there any common cause? Yeah, well, I think there's a narrative that this Arab Spring was surprising, but it actually wasn't. I mean, we've been talked, I mean, even Condi Rice, um, 04, 05, would say things like the status quo is untenable, and she would keep on repeating that. And that's a line that we heard from Middle East analysts for quite some time now. And I think we have to just acknowledge the very basic fact autocracies don't last forever. And I think there was a sense in Washington that these regimes were durable. They were going to last somehow, that they were somehow immune from the broader historical sweep that we saw in other regions of the world. So I mean, uh, the factors were all there. What I think had to happen was the spark. And Tunisia provided that initial spark, but all the other basic factors were there. High levels of unemployment and underemployment, the fact that people were living on the, under these dictatorships for really, you know, 50 years. I mean, this has been going on for such mm -hmm. a long time now. And also anger, and I think this is important because it's not just about domestic policy. Arabs were also angry that their autocratic leaders were too pro-U.S. Mm -hmm. or pro-Israel and weren't reflecting mm -hmm. their own preferences on foreign policy. So you put that all together, and it was really just a matter of time. Richard, maybe you can talk a bit about your own views from having done this report on what role did uh, technology and social media play? Well, <clears throat> first of all, it, Colin is right, and others have made this point too. It's not that new technologies <clears throat> or the internet caused revolution. I mean, the people caused a revolution, and the causes why they wanted to have a revolution are some of the ones that Shadi just talked about. But 
it, it seems to me that these tools really did matter, and they mattered in a way that's been different than what we've seen in the past with other forms of communications technologies. Um, and they've, ha they've mattered in a couple of different ways. So first, one of the things that's been striking about this series of political revolutions has been the speed with which the demonstration effect has happened in one country. Um, and people throughout uh, the Middle East have been able to see images and get information about what's happening in countries, uh, whereas previously they would have been much more limited in, to do, in, in doing. Um, so there's been uh, an educational or an informational process, an awareness process, and potentially a, politi uh, a politicizing effect. Um, there's also been uh, a growing sentiment among people in countries that their view, which may have been in opposition to the regime, was not the only one, that they had a shared sense of of opposition. The, the technologies have been used quite obviously um, to organize protests on Facebook and, and, and things like that. Um, and then there's been an interaction with satellite TV. So in a place like Yemen where um, you know few people have the internet, but a lot of people watch satellite TV, a lot of the images that have been on Al Jazeera have actually been YouTube videos. So there's been this kind of interaction there. But the other thing that I would point out um, is that describes the kind of democratic uh, protester side of the equation, and there's the regime side of the equation, too, which has very carefully been trying to use these tools to do just the opposite, which is to crack down on protesters. So, uh, you know, there were Facebook organized uh, protests in Tunisia. Well, the Tunisian government cracked all the Facebook accounts in the entire country. Um, in Egypt, infamously, the regime pulled the plug on the internet, but that was after it had been using it to monitor uh, people. And in Syria, um, in what was billed as a concession of the protesters, Facebook, which had been banned for two years, they allowed to go back online. And there were a lot of suspicions that this could have been the best thing that the regime could have invited, because a lot of people who don't know how to use Facebook in a secure fashion would go online, and then the regime would have access to them and all of their friends and everything that they're talking about and make it that much easier to crack down. So it's a very much a contested space. But those, I think, are some of the initial ways that we can see how um, this had uh, an overall effect on the, the political change. Colin sketched out what I thought was a, I hope you're right, but a quite optimistic scenario that subsequently will be better off in the Middle East um, because we'll have more solid friendship foundation and not just with some dictator or some king. I'd like to ask you, Andrew, uh, despite what Nate said about forecasting, <laughs> to look ahead, because it seems to me it depends on how this turns out, whether, um, whether the, I mean, clearly you're right that Al-Qaeda is currently uh, delegitimized, um, but if people don't wind up with more dignity, which is the key word, I think, um, and a, a better uh, economic situation, then I think they'll be in search of something else. Yeah, let me just start off by maybe reinforcing some of the things that, that uh, my fellow panelists have talked about. I, I think I agree with Colin, um, not just because I hesitate to disagree with the former college debate champion, but I, uh, I agree with Colin vis-a-vis uh, -vis Al Qaeda. I think Al Qaeda has been, uh, has been weakened. Um, and I think that this, you know, the Arab Spring really was in a lot of ways the demise of, uh, of Al Qaeda. And with uh, Richard talks about something I think is very, also very important, which is that if you're going to talk about technology in the Middle East, which Richard does so in a very good and nuanced way in his new report, um, you have to really look at it as part and parcel of a broader Arab public sphere that's been developing over the past 20 years. And uh, Mark Lynch was with us for, uh, for breakfast. He's now on his way to, uh, to Egypt. But nobody's been better at describing you know, kind of the new Arab public sphere than, uh, than Mark Lynch, Abu Adbark himself. Um, and, uh, and really, you look at the ways in which not just uh, satellite television, but also satellite newspapers, and then you know, later uh, the internet has uh, created a unified uh, public sphere within the Arabic-speaking world. That is very much true. On the other hand, the individual conditions in each country differ greatly. Um, you know, Lisa Anderson, who's now the president of the American University of Cairo, had a good, uh, good article in the latest Foreign Affairs talking about the very fundamental differences between the challenges that a state like Libya will face and a state like Egypt. When you're talking about Egypt and, uh, and Tunisia, we spend justifiably a lot of time worrying about the direction in which Egypt will go. But Egypt at least has state institutions. 
Libya doesn't even have that. They, uh, you know, not only were they, uh, did they inherit, a, and apologies to the, uh, to the Italians, my wife is Italian, love Italy, but they did a horrible job of building up institutions during the colonial era in, in Libya. And then they were then followed by, uh, by a man, Muammar Gaddafi, who's had no interest in building up state institutions. So when you look at the individual challenges that a lot of these states are gonna face, uh, Egypt, which should worry us tremendously because it has 83 million people, because it's so pivotal in the Arabic-speaking world. Uh, Egypt's actually the easy case. There we're talking about security sector reform. We're talking about the reform of political institutions. We're talking about making political institutions responsive to the, uh, to, to the public. That's all good, that's all, that's all happy. Um, but in places like, uh, in places like Libya, um, the, uh, the, the situation could be much more dire going forward. So I, I actually worry a lot more about Libya than I think the administration does, unfortunately. Can I add a more pessimistic note? Mm -hmm, please. Even more, yeah. oh, and then we'll take your questions. Well, I, I, think, I think even the phrase Arab Spring is by now a bit of a misnomer, because what does spring suggest? It flowers, blossoming, forward momentum. And that is certainly not what we're seeing right now. I mean, I was in Tahrir Square on February 11th when Mubarak stepped down, and it was one of the most beautiful things I've seen. And it was just remarkable to be there at that time. And I think, unfortunately, though, some of that euphoria was premature. And just in a couple months, we've seen what's happened. There was a hope that leaders would use less force, but in fact, they're using more force. And you know, we're talking about, will Syria lead the transition? We're, we're beyond that. Syria has killed more than 1,000 of its own citizens. I mean, that's just a level that, that is just really remarkable. And you add that to, to Libya, uh, Bahrain, which is a close ally of ours, and they're essentially waging war against their own people. So all of this suggests that the Arab Spring is going in a very troubling direction. And I think this is where the US role becomes more important because um, it hasn't spread throughout the region. We're talking about two countries where there's been revolutions out of 20. That's a pretty low percentage. So I think going forward, the Obama administration's rhetoric is great. The US is on the side of freedom and democracy, but in practice, that is not what's happening. And if you look at the perspective from the Arab world, they see our role as Americans very differently than we see it. And they see us as being on the wrong side of history. And we have been behind, and for, even from my standpoint, we've been behind the curve in nearly every single Arab country. We only support revolutions after they happen, not before they happen, and that's really the true test. I mean, even Tunisia, Obama came out with some great words um, supporting their aspirations only after President Ben Ali had already left the country and was on a plane. That's not going to cut it. Can I, can I, add? I want to make, I want to mention the unmentionable country of Saudi Arabia because as you say about Libya, there are no institutions. Well, yeah, that, there's, there's, there's a bigger Saudi Arabia problem. I mean, the president, you know, made a very good speech um, and he talked about women's rights and he talked about uh, the freedom of worship and he didn't mention the word Saudi or Arabia anywhere in that, uh, in that speech when of course when you're thinking about women's rights, the right to worship, the right of minorities, you know, Saudi Arabia is the country that, that looms large and the one thing, okay, I'm, I'm going to disobey my rule. I am going to pick a fight with, uh, with Khan a little bit. Um, we have been hypocritical to a, to a degree, especially with respect to, uh, to Bahrain. And it's not just us, because we talk about the democratizing influence of, uh, of Al Jazeera. Jazeera, Arabic at least, did a great job in Egypt. They were largely pretty quiet. Their coverage was pretty crappy on Bahrain. And in addition, we were pretty uh, supportive of the, uh, of the democracy movement in Egypt. But when, uh, when Saudi Arabia invaded uh, another country along with other GCC nations, we were, we were pretty quiet about that. Um, I think there were some good reasons for, uh, for doing so in terms of US interests, perhaps. But, uh, but it's, it's quite laughable to talk about you know, Iranian intervention in Bahrain when you have the GCC nations uh, occupying it militarily. They're trying to draw the protective corral around monarchies. Yeah, and I mean, say these things happen in yeah, nasty I mean, authoritarian dictatorships, but we're different. Um, now the GCC includes Morocco and uh, and Jordan, which yeah, they're adding aren't the in the Gulf, the club but of do kings, have one right? thing in common, right? Uh, we should take questions from some of the club of kings and queens here. <clears throat> Who wants to ask a question? I see people standing, but I don't, are you? Oh, okay. All right, then I'm going to ask. Well, we got a Twitter question. Oh, 
I wanted to live tweet this myself, as I said, with the, uh, with the microphone. I couldn't do it with the... Uh, the... Um, I'm going to add on to this Twitter question, uh, which is, how can social network activity provide post-revolution guidance to emergent democracies? I'd like to broaden that to what can the U.S. do to shape events? You say it's already going in the wrong direction. How much authority and influence do we have in, and I realize it varies from country to country, and, and should we use it, or if we attempt to encourage Bahrain, are we only going to screw it up? The, as Shadi was, and Andrew were saying before, U.S. policy in the Middle East is going, has been and will continue to be attacked as inconsistent because we say that we support democracy and, and human rights everywhere. We apply that inconsistently. Some leaders, we say, must go on the basis of that principle. Others, we say nothing about. That is true, and it's also going to be a fact of life. I mean, no superpower is going to apply dogmatically uh, a foreign policy that is rooted only in the promotion of democracy and human rights in a region that it finds that vital security and economic interests. So the question is, how do you balance those security and economic interests with your promotion of democracy and your standing for human rights? And the opportunity, I think, in the Arab spring, summer, fall, year, whatever uh, it may be, is that uh, we can actually align our interests and our values better than they've been aligned in the past. That certainly won't be true for every country, because there's no change happening in some countries. But in a country like Egypt, for example, in 2003 and 2004, when the Bush administration was pressing the case for reform, the Egyptians would come and say, well, you can either have us continue to close off Gaza and participate in the Middle East peace process and work with you on counterterrorism cooperation, or you can really give us a hard time on reform. You pick which one you want. If there's a democratic government there that we are actively supporting through the kinds of things, that some of which the administration has talked about, um, debt relief, if there's a trade framework that would loop in um, that hopefully the Europeans could become a part of that would um, have some economic incentives for these kind of countries. Um, and if we're moving in the same direction to support the democracies that are also our partners um, on these interests, then that would be the best possible outcome. Is Egypt moving in the right direction? I mean, how you're the Islamist party uh, expert here. How much should one um, worry about the... Right. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I think in, in a lot of the Western coverage, there was a sense that these were secular revolutions. That's not true. They were only secular insofar as people weren't explicitly raising Islamist slogans. The Muslim Brotherhood ordered its members in Tahrir Square to not say anything remotely Islamists, don't raise Qurans, don't do any of that, because they knew that that might provoke the West and also the regime. And now if we're looking, you know, two or three months into the post-revolutionary era, there's no doubt about it. The Muslim Brotherhood is the single most powerful political force in Egypt. And, you know, I was just in Egypt two weeks ago and I met with the top three leaders of the Brotherhood's new political party. They're pretty confident. They're pretty confident about their chances. That said, they're not trying to win a majority because, again, they're worried that might worry people too much. But they could win a plurality of the vote. I think we shouldn't be as worried about the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood, after all, is a nonviolent organization that has long been part of the political process in Egypt. What we're seeing now is far-right Islamist parties emerging really um, almost out of nowhere. And you have not one Salafi group, but three Salafi groups that are trying to form political parties. So they're going to enter the electoral ring. And so you add the Muslim Brotherhood, three Salafi parties. There's also one or two progressive Islamist parties. Altogether, they could, um, they could win 50% of the, of, of the seats in parliament. Um, again, I think a lot of the alarmism that we have in Washington is unfounded because, again, um, they're not as radical as we sometimes think they are. And in some ways, they reflect Egyptian popular sentiment. This is a conservative, religious Society, And we've seen a number of polls the last couple months where um, anywhere between 60 to 90 percent of Egyptians believe that Islamic law should be the main source of legislation or the only source of legislation. Let's be honest about this. There is no constituency for what we call secularism 
in a place like Egypt today. And even, even the word secular, secularist in Arabic, no one would actually call themselves that publicly. So I think we have to be realistic about where Egypt is going, but I think that's why we have to engage with groups like the Muslim Brotherhood. And it's very troubling to me that we don't have any channels of dialogue with them. We've been afraid to even talk to them. So now they might become the most um, you know, powerful force in the new parliament, and we don't know who to talk to. That's troubling. Mm -hmm. uh, the gentleman in the back over here. They're bringing you a microphone. Could you uh, state your name and affiliation? Peter Wilson. We're on. We're on. Uh, Peter Wilson Rand. Um, follow up to this question. It seems to me that a number of you already alluded to the realities of the evolution of this revolution in Egypt, that we're going to inevitably now go through a very tough time vis-a-vis uh, -vis Egypt and its evolution vis-a-vis -vis Israel. There's reports in today's Financial Times that the natural gas pipeline has been repaired. And for, again, internal political reasons, there's not been a resumption of the sale of gas to Israel. The opening up of Gaza Strip, et cetera. And then, obviously, one of the interesting questions is to what degree the subject of the uh, peace process, to the degree that it exists, becomes an important feature of the political dialogue and debate inside Egypt. Well, right. I'll take right a few ahead, things. Colin. Yeah, I mean, I think we don't know what Egypt's foreign policy orientation overall is going to be. Um, I will tell you that we're doing a number of things uh, to try to maintain a, a good relationship with all, uh, with you know, across the political spectrum uh, in in Egypt, and also facilitate the transition. There's the economic package that President Obama announced. There's the efforts to work with the international community to bring even more economic resources to bear. Because frankly, whoever wins the next parliamentary election and presidential election is going to face a set of monumental challenges economically, and it'll be very difficult to live up to the expectations and aspirations of the people who protested on the streets during the fall of Mubarak. Uh, we're also uh, working uh, on our democracy assistance programs to try to help nascent political actors who aren't as well uh, mobilized uh, learn how to run campaigns and do political platforms and, and compete, and that will be a gradual process. Um, and the last thing we're trying to do in Egypt is maintain a good relationship with the Egyptian military, which I think has the possibility of being a kind of guardian for democracy. I think what's interesting about the role that the military played in the transition is that they really played a, a role as a buffer between the regime and the people and established a lot of credibility with the Egyptian people. Uh, and I think that the Egyptian military can continue to play a positive role moving forward. And this speaks actually directly to your question about Israel. Look, Egypt and Israel in many res respects have had a cold peace, not a warm peace. All right, there's not a lot of love uh, between, uh, between uh, the Egyptian military and the Israeli uh, military, for example. Uh, but the Egyptian military does have a fundamental interest in maintaining the peace with Israel. Right. They have no interest in having that border become active. They have no interest in having a war with Israel. And they have at least a billion reasons uh, uh, every year uh, to maintain a positive relationship with Israel. And that, of course, is the security assistance that we provide them, which is conditioned upon uh, the, maintaining the peace agreement with Israel. So I think the military in Egypt is an important counterweight to some of these tendencies. But certainly, you're seeing with the reconciliation agreement between Fatah and Hamas, with the reopening of Rafa, that you are going to see an Egyptian polity, which will have to be more responsive to uh, the fact that the vast majority of, of people in Egypt have, di have difficulties with the relationship uh, with Israel. And I actually see the reconciliation in the Rafa crossings as throwing a bone to the street on some issues as it relates to Israel, while the more fundamental strategic question of the peace agreement is maintained uh, at the highest level of governments. And, and I will tell you that in our interactions with Egyptian officials, and I've sat with uh, Secretary Gates and Field Marshal Tantawi on more than one uh, occasion to include since the revolution happened that I think the, the elite that's likely to remain very important in the new Egypt will remain committed to the, to the peace agreement. But I think there will be more tensions with Israel than there were before. Yeah, Andrew, I mean, you wanted to add? Colin was talking a lot of sense there. I mean, on the one hand, success in Egypt looks like institutions and politicians that were responsive to the will of the people. And it's not just the extremist groups that are going to be using uh, the you know, conflict between Israel and the Palestinians to, uh, to curry favor. They don't, they don't have to. 
uh, the people of Egypt are genuine, have a genuine uh, support for the Palestinian people and for Palestinian statehood and for Palestinian dignity. That's not anything that's ginned up by outside forces. That's genuine and it's from the, uh, from the people. On the other hand, Colin's exactly right that the, uh, the institution the, of the, that is the Egyptian military is fundamentally conservative. And it will resist, I think, any, any big swings in Egyptian foreign policy going forward. The gentleman here in the front. Here she comes. Up there. <clears throat> My name's Chris Taylor. I'm with Mission Essential Personnel. I wonder if we could just, um, through the digital age perspective, talk about what these things mean um, from a U.S. public diplomacy strategic perspective. Um, should we only be relying on the viral spread of things uh, for the digital age to help us virally spread uh, and facilitate changes? Or do we need to return to a US information agency? Uh, how, how do we better strategically and tactically use what we've got in front of us? Uh, and, I, and for any comment from anyone. Richard? I think part of this goes back to the big attempt here is to try to change the narrative. Um, and the president has done that through his speeches, the narrative of Al Qaeda on the one hand, democratic aspirations, and where the United States comes down on this. We're not just in the business of stopping terrorism, but actually should be on the side of people who are pursuing their legitimate democratic aspirations. The form and the way that that happens, I think, should be as much as we can throw at that in, in the sense that uh, the, the State Department now, for example, has uh, a Farsi language spokesman and, and Farsi Twitter feeds and, and so forth. That's good. Um, the Broadcasting Board of Governors is doing more. There's, um, on the internet freedom side, the US government now is spending $30 million a year on not public diplomacy, but making different platforms available and training people so they can communicate amongst uh, themselves. Uh, the idea of reconstituting USIA has been percolating since about a day after USAI folded. And I mean, <laughs> having seen over the past few years various government agencies be formed anew, I'm not sure the track record is all that great without offending anyone here who works for one of those agencies. So I'd be a little hesitant to bureaucratically reform USIA. But I think that you know, when it comes to all forms of social media and, and, and speeches and everything, that we can push out as much of this as we can. And part of this also is devolving um, the ability to do this to people in the countries themselves, ambassadors and embassy staff. And uh, the, the State Department has sort of the opposite model of the military in that sense, where the State Department, everything has to be cleared back in Washington before you can say it in Cairo, whereas the military and guys are running around all over the place saying things. And so there, there's, uh, <laughs> um, so there, there's uh, I, I think the State Department is ultimately going to have to be more nimble and move more toward uh, the military's model in that sense. I think we shouldn't underestimate just how much impact the plain old exchange of information mm -hmm. available on the internet does right. have on young people, even in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. where they now have, when I started going there, there was the newspaper to read and the king was at the top and then the crown prince, then the, you know, on down, no matter what happened, the hierarchy was there. Now, you know, people get, somewhat more honest information, and they don't have the same uh, respect or fear of their leaders anymore. Uh, there was uh, over here. Well, this is something, this is becoming problematic because the Brotherhood is exploring the possibility of forming coalitions with Salafi groups, not because they have any ideological affinity. Salafis and, and Muslim brothers haven't usually gotten along in Egypt, but the Brotherhood is a very pragmatic organization. So if it thinks that it can improve its electoral chances by allying itself with far right groups, that's what it will do. And so I think it's important to look at how can we kind of find ways to 
keep the brotherhood in a more kind of center-right area of the political spectrum. From a US perspective, we don't have a lot of power over that. But I, I do think um, starting a real substantive dialogue with Muslim Brotherhood leaders as soon as possible is crucial. We have to reach out to them, have a better understanding of where they're coming from, where their interests are. And that is going to help down the road. And it will also give us some degree of leverage with them. Um, they do care about what the US thinks about them. They are sensitive to international opinion. And um, that's why you know, they have been careful about how they're perceived in terms of trying to win a majority in Egypt today. So I think there is some opportunity there. Um, if we're talking about the Brotherhood versus Al Qaeda, thankfully, that wedge is still very much there. I mean, Al Qaeda and the Brotherhood pretty much hate each other. And I don't really see that changing anytime soon. So that's something good. And that's why, in some respects, the Brotherhood serves as a counterweight to some of those more extremist groups, because if someone joins the Muslim Brotherhood, we might, we might not like their ideology, but at least they're not going to be using violence. Can I, can I actually ask a follow-up question to that? Within the, uh, the Brotherhood, I mean, it's not a unitary actor. And we saw during the, uh, you know, during the demonstrations, we saw a divide start to emerge between the younger activists mm. and between kind of the, the old line. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about you know, how we can engage different parts of the Brotherhood? Or are there different factions within it, especially, uh, especially in the youth, that may be more amenable to, uh, to, uh, to outreach? Right. I mean, yeah, the Brotherhood is a map. And can I tack on to yeah, that? Yeah, sure. If, okay. if, as you predict, there's a kind of 50% Islamist across mm. the spectrum government, will they fight amongst each other? Or will they uh, right. run the country in a way we don't want it to go? Right. Well, the Brotherhood is a massive organization. And it's, it, in some ways, it's just a giant bureaucracy of sorts. Um, so there are different tendencies within the movement. And there is a division now between some of the Muslim Brotherhood youth who are in Tahrir Square and who are cooperating very closely with their liberal and secular counterparts. And they have a different kind of outlook, much more open, um, very much part of the social media atmosphere. And there's been some talk of defections from the Brotherhood as, as some of these youth kind of have a different view of where the organization should go. Those are the kind of people that. And they're ready to talk to, yeah. to, to Americans and to talk to US officials. And you know, again, we should be doing that and hearing what they have to say and seeing how, um, not that we, how we support what they're doing, but the youth in general, how we find a way to support the role in the new Egypt. Because right now, mm -hmm. the youth were very or excellent at bringing down a regime. Mm -hmm. They're much less effective in the post-revolutionary era, where they're a relatively weak force, and they're having trouble organizing. Mm -hmm. So um, and on, on your question about um, the Muslim Brotherhood and, and Islamists and whether they'll take, um, you know, what will they do in foreign policy and all of that, um, I think what, we, what I would like to see, and God knows if this will happen, is a kind of broad national unity government where you have the Muslim Brotherhood, liberal groups, and leftists um, kind of coming together and finding ways to govern together. The last thing, I don't think what Egypt needs right now is a fully Islamist government. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to Muslim Brotherhood leaders, they're aware that Egypt isn't ready for that, the US isn't ready for that, and that's going to cause a lot of alarm on the international stage. So I think there is a realization on the Brotherhood's part that that's not the way to go. Uh, we have a question from the overflow room, and since they can't be here to raise their hand, uh, I'll ask on their behalf. Could the panel discuss the rebel response to NATO air campaign in Libya, whether positive or negative? And if also the issue of our other reform movements in the Arab world seeking military assistance, covert or overt? Yeah, Colin, talk Give about us the Colin. covert one first. Yeah, tell us the covert. <laughs> plans <laughs> in written format, signed in triplicate. You did this, huh? Marine Corps University Press <laughs> transcribing all this. I have my clearance in my pocket. I'll tear it up before I, uh, I'm obviously not going to answer the, the, the latter. Um, Darn. And, and frankly, I, I can't speak to the, I can't, I, I just won't speak to the, to the Libya question because it's not in, 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 in my portfolio. I think that we have seen, we have seen outreach by a lot of groups across the region. But, but the one point I would make is the overwhelming majority of the groups across the region that are protesting are doing so peacefully. And, the for, and they're not looking to us 
for a lot of material assistance. They are looking to us for political support, for symbolic support. We're doing our best uh, to, to do that uh, diplomatically. But I mean, I don't know how the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening or whatever you want to call it, I don't know whether it's going to turn into a summer or into a fall or a winter. I don't know uh, which way it's going to go. But the, the, the violence in the equations here have largely been initiated by the regimes in this equation, not the resistance uh, uh, in, in, in this equation, which is one of the reasons why I think violent resistance movements could be in trouble if this actually works out well, uh, because they've been violently resisting for decades and failing. And now we see some opportunity for peaceful resistance to actually work. And that could be a pretty potent model. Yeah. I mean, I think just with respect to the, the, the rebels in Libya, and I, you know, I haven't been on the ground and spent a lot of time with them, but you know, if, if you read a lot of the accounts of some of the great journalists on the ground, like Chris Shivers from the New York Times, Brian Denton, his, uh, his partner in crime over there, you see a tactical evolution that, uh, that's taking place that's be more or less expected from a non-state actor you know, on the battlefield trying to, uh, to learn. I think one of the biggest deficiencies that the Libyan rebels have had has not been in terms of equipment or, or fancy, uh, you know, fancy weaponry, but really in terms of just learning how to fight cohesively on the battlefield. We're starting to see an evolution. Um, and it's interesting from you know, the perspective of somebody who studies these things, but, uh, but I'd hesitate to, uh, to speak too extensively on that subject without, without being able to, uh, to see more on the ground. Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, I had a question about- Can you identify sorry, yourself sorry, and okay. use the mic? Uh, can you hear me now? Great, uh, Remish Ali, and I had a question about um, uh, whether or not, I mean, people are talking a lot about a possible Palestinian autumn. And if we see sort of a Palestinian nonviolent resistance, um, I'm wondering what is your advice as a panel to the U.S. as a response? Because, you know, there's one thing to be a conflictual response between Bahrain versus um, Syria versus Libya. But if there's a conflicted response on a Palestinian nonviolent you know, resistance, then that could be very interesting for the region. Mm -hmm. yeah. Who wants to? Yeah. I'm looking at Shadi. I don't want to okay. answer this question, but. I don't want to either, but I'll try. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let Colin do it. I mean, yeah, let Colin do it. <laughs> I mean, here's the, the U.S. is going to be in a very difficult position come autumn. And the Palestinians will take their case to the U.N. to seek formal recognition of a state. And you know, the rest of the world is going to be supporting them in that to different degrees. And presumably, we won't, as Obama, I think, said in his recent speech. And this fits into a broader question of you know, if there is a, you know, a full-on nonviolent movement that emerges in the Palestinian territories, how are we going to react? And at breakfast, Mark Lynch made a very interesting point about that. Um, that is going to be one of the, any goodwill that he was saying that we're going to bring on because of our response to the Arab Spring. We'll lose 100% of that if we're seen as siding with Israel against the nonviolent Palestinian movement. I don't know how you square that circle, and I guess I'd be interested to hear what, what Colin thinks on this. But um... Well, speaking for the administration. <laughs> I, I was just looking for like, the prop. Does anybody have a third rail I can, uh, <laughs> I can grab onto with my teeth? Um, what are your views on Social Security? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Move it all into the defense budget. Right, yeah. uh, that never gets cut. Yeah, right. Um, no, look, uh, I, I think that what we see is in the fall, you're going to see a very dicey time. I mean, I'm not sure that the, I think the clock there are kind of two clocks, a near-term clock and a long-term clock that I, that, I, that I think are going to be problematic. The near-term clock, clock is that you are going to see a Palestinian uh, drive, I think, for a declaration of statehood in the General Assembly uh, uh, in the fall. Uh, I think the president has made crystal clear that we want a two-state outcome. We see that as something that should emerge from negotiations and the parties not be imposed uh, uh, by the international community through the UN. You know, I don't know. Uh, you know, there's obviously a debate about whether the president, in leaning forward on, on stating some of the principles that we all knew, I mean, this created a lot of political theater in Washington last, last week, but there was a lot of banality in those, in those statements, actually, too. Shocking that the future of a two states would be, you know, the starting point would be 67 borders with adjustments. I mean, and that was what the entire soap opera of the last week was about, was about, uh, you know, interpreting that, in, that, that line. Um, but I don't know whether that, you know, whether, whether we'll have enough buy-in from the international community into our view, which is that, 
uh, there should be a you know, negotiated outcome that isn't imposed by the UN or, or you know, how the Palestinians will, will fare, but I think it's going to create a challenge for yeah. the Israeli government. The long-term challenge is the demographic one. And I think Jeffrey Goldberg has been very good about this. I mean, in 10 or 20 years, what if the Palestinians don't go to the UN and ask for their own state? What if the Palestinians go to the UN and ask to vote? The Israeli, what's the Israeli response to that? The Israeli response to that is no, and we're going to drift towards a, towards a, a state that would, be, I, I think, be viewed as undemocratic by a large number of folks uh, around the world, or yes, in which case the Zionist dream of a democratic uh, and Jewish Israel goes away. So that's a demographic reality that's, I mean, that's coming down. That's yeah. a freight train coming down the line. So even if you get past this fall, you're talking about a long-term challenge. So it's for that reason that the president did lean forward mm -hmm. in pushing the, uh, the uh, you know, both sides to get back to the negotiating table. Both, all those outcomes are, are suboptimal. And, and I'll just return to the point I made at the outset, which is the, one of the great things about the Arab Spring is that it's not about us and it's not about Israel. But it will become, at least in part, about Israel once elections start happening in these places. And it will be uh, partly about Israel as some regimes try to divert attention towards Israel, as we saw with the Nakba protests along the borders with Lebanon uh, and, and Syria uh, a few weeks ago. All right? And I think Israel, it, Israel has an interest in getting out ahead of that uh, by making some progress on the Palestinian uh, front, too. And I think that was the, that was the position the president I mean, Colin, can I just push you on this not about us comment just for, for a second? Because this is what we've been hearing from senior Obama officials for a long time now. This is about them. It's not about us. I mean, we were supporting many of these regimes with billions of dollars for five decades. How is it not about us? I mean, I, there's almost a sense that we're pretending to be this innocent bystander. We're watching this, and we're supporting the aspirations of the Arab people when we were never neutral in this. And in fact, we were siding with the wrong side, at least from the perspective you know, of, Arab, of Arab people. So I mean- And continue to. And continue to to this very day, to this very day. I mean, here's Bahrain on the table right now, you know, allegedly wanting to negotiate with their own people. Where are we gonna be in, in that right. actively quietly doing something, actively overtly doing something, or just praying? Do you want me to bail you out for a second? No, 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 no I, got, I got this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when we, I think that when we say, or at least when I say, it's not about us, I mean that the hundreds of thousands of people protesting in the streets aren't protesting about the relationship between the regime and the United States, right? They're not, pro in, a, in a way in which, for example, the insurgent violence in Iraq was in response to our presence in Iraq, right? As well as a set of sectarian divisions and other things, but we were very much at the center of unrest and violence in Iraq in the aftermath of the fall of Saddam Hussein. We were not at the center in Tahrir Square. We were not in the center of Tunis. We are, we, we're not at the center in Sana'a. We are not in the center in Manama or in Dara or any of these other, other places. The revolutions or the unrest, the popular turmoil, the protests are driven by a popular response to a set of economic and political structural challenges and inequalities, injustices, perceived illegitimacies that have been around for decades and have now, the you know, it's been a nonlinear shift in the environment, right? Once one happened, people said, oh my gosh, this could happen. And so that's what we mean when it's not about us. Clearly, we've, we are relevant to the equation. Our relationships to these regimes ha are relevant. We're just not the driving factor, which is why I think we've tried to position ourselves uh, and, and make clear what our set of principles and what, the narr what our narrative is. And that's why the president spoke uh, so eloquently about that uh, uh, 10 days ago. Bahrain. I was with the Secretary of Defense in Manama on March 12th, two days before uh, the Saudis and the Emiratis uh, crossed the causeway into Bahrain. And of course, that trip was interpreted that we were there giving the green light to the Saudi uh, uh, forces moving in. Quite to the contrary. We were there to push the national dialogue forward and get the government in Bahrain to move forward on some steps on civil rights. And in fact, 36 hours later, uh, Ambassador Feldman, Assistant Secretary of, of State for Near Eastern Affairs, was going to come in to try to get the national dialogue started. In that intervening period, there was a very violent Sunday set of protests that provided the excuse or the rationale, check, uh, check your language, uh, to, for the forces to come in. And we saw what we saw. Now, it's right that we weren't, during that initial period, all right, we were relatively quiet. But don't confuse public, being publicly quiet 
with what we were doing behind the scenes to push the Bahraini government, to push our GCC partners, to make the point that yes, you have legitimate concerns about security, yes, you have legitimate concerns about law and order, yes, you have legitimate concerns about Iran exploiting the circumstances here, but there's ultimately no security solution here, there's only a political solution and you have to get back to that. We saw with the lifting of the state of emergency yesterday uh, and some of the other steps that the Crown Prince uh, and the King have talked about that maybe, maybe, we're getting back on the right, on the right track. But I will tell you that the President had some pretty strong words about Bahrain in the speech. Right, so it's not that, we're quiet, that we've been quiet, it's just, it's, these are messy, these are hard, these are tough uh, questions and we're trying to stick by our principles while executing them in a pragmatic way. On that note, we are going to have to close, unfortunately, uh, pragmatically. Um, so please join me in thanking the panel.